Shelley Fisher Fishkin is a professor at Stanford University and a noted Mark Twain scholar. And nearly a century after his death, she's helping bring his long lost play, Is He Dead?, to Broadway for the first time. And it's an interesting story just how you found it and how this came to happen. Thanks for being with us. My pleasure. Uh, so you discovered it in 2002? Yes. And how did that come about? How was it not found for a century? Well, I wouldn't say it was completely unknown. I was doing research in the Bancroft Library uh, where the Mark Twain papers are at UC Berkeley. I was working on a different book, and I had to look up something in a bad play Twain had written in the 1870s, and I really was not looking forward to it because I knew it was, it was, a, it was not a good play. It was a collaboration with Bret Hart, and I'd like to blame a lot of its badness on Bret Hart, but I'm not sure I can do that totally. But to my surprise, there was an entire file drawer filled with Twain's plays, manuscripts of plays. And I'd realized I was familiar with a few of them, but not all of them. And I decided to eat my spinach as a scholar and just read the drawer from start to finish. And it was rough going. Yeah. Um, How many plays? Oh, there were, there were oh, well over a dozen. Really? Um, when I got to the penultimate play, um, I sat down, started on the first page reading through his manuscript, and then I began giggling. It was great fun. It was a zany cross-dressing farce uh, set in France that was written in 1898, a period that is known as a being a very grim, dark period for Twain. And I was just astonished that he could produce something this wild and over the top and funny. And I really was determined then that I wanted to bring it to the stage. Um, a handful of scholars over the last hundred years had known of its existence and had uh, included a footnote or a paragraph or two about it in something published. But no one had tried to bring it to the stage and I decided that that was something I really wanted to do for Twain. Um, he'd been good, for, good to me. I decided that this was a way that I could uh, repay the favor. Let's talk a little bit more about the context of when he wrote it. He was in Vienna at the time, mm -hmm. right? Yes. And he wanted to be a playwright. It never quite worked out for him, but it was, he loved the theater. It was something mm -hmm. that was important to him. Yes, he actually had an early success which really whetted his appetite. He had a Broadway hit in the early 1870s, um, but it was not a good play. It was a <laughs> one-character play that the, uh, I mean, it wasn't supposed to be one-character play. It was a dramatization of his novel, The Gilded Age. It was called Colonel Sellers. And in effect, it was a one-character play that the actor John Raymond brought alive. The one thing to be said for it is that it gave a famous phrase to American culture, the phrase, there's millions in it, <laughs> comes from that play. Um, but he decided for the rest of his life he wanted to make it um, on the stage. And part of this was because he loved theater. Um, ever since uh, his earliest exposure to theater, he was absolutely entranced by it. Um, and also he thought that it was a, a quick way to, uh, to make a lot of money. Um, when he was in Vienna um, in the eight, late 1890s, uh, he was there because his daughter Clara was studying piano with a great Viennese um, musician. But he also lucked into the most exciting and stimulating theater scene in all of Europe at the time. Uh, as the writer uh, Stefan Zweig has noted, when, Viennese would, when the Viennese would pick up their morning newspaper in 1898 in Vienna, they, the first section they would go to would be the theater section. The real news in the city was what was happening in theater. Um, there were state-of-the-art theaters. In fact, Twain was given a VIP tour of the Berg Theater, the greatest theater in Europe at the time. Uh, the most advanced uh, special effects, et cetera, just before he wrote this play. He was attending plays constantly, great plays with great actors, so impressive that he wrote a rather uh, complaining article about how pale and boring the New York stage was compared with what was going on in Vienna and why was this the case. Um, and so he was exposed to wonderful theater, was collaborating with playwrights, um, and really um, I think this had an impact on his ability to write a play that was unlike any of the others he had attempted. And he thought or hoped that it would be put on in London, and he had this relationship with Bram Stoker, right? Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, he knew Bram Stoker through their mutual friend, the actor uh, Sir Henry Irving. Bram Stoker of Dracula fame, right. we should Bram, say. Bram Stoker of Dracula fame, although Dracula was, was still, uh, still in his future when Twain had met him. Um, and he managed the Lyceum Theatre in London. Um, which was Sir Henry Irving's theater, and he'd agreed to be Twain's agent for this play, but the play arrived on his desk around the same time that a disastrous warehouse fire burned up the prop sets and costumes for over 250 productions and changed Bram Stoker's and Henry Irving's life uh, in the theater forever. So very, very bad timing. Um, and then Twain uh, thought, well, maybe it could be produced in New York, but, you know, he was still living in Vienna. He was doing everything kind of by remote control. He sent it off to friends in the States who were uh, going to try to interest, um, interest 
some producers in New York, uh, including Daniel Froman, who would uh, who would later build the Lyceum Theater in New York, yeah. where the play is going going to open eventually, 100 years later. Um, by the time Twain's play arrived in New York in the spring of 1898, the Spanish-American War had broken out, and patriotic fair was all the rage, and it was just the wrong time for a cross-dressing farce set in France. And it's continued to be a star-crossed play. It's been performed twice, right? You've actually seen it. Yes, I saw the first preview, and it was absolutely delightful. Uh, Michael Blakemore is an inspired director, and Norbert Leo Butz did a brilliant job of playing both the famous French painter Jean-Francois Millet and his widowed sister, the widow to you. Explain the story a little bit more. It's about an artist or a group of artists. Well, it's it's loosely uh, about the real French painter, Jean-Francois Millet, but Twain takes a lot of liberties um, and about the only thing that is actually factually accurate is the fact that Millet existed and painted all the paintings he's credited with having painted in the play. Beyond that, Twain is really imagining um, an, intriguing, an intriguing plot. Um, a, an art dealer who is in love with the young woman who loves Millet uh, has decided that he is going to ruin Millet and all of his followers in Barbizon. And he can, given, uh, given the fact that he's bought up the rights to all, all of his paintings up to that time. Um, the painters are desperate. They're not just starving, but driven to the point of suicide. And Millet and his friends are about to take their lives when a young American in the group, uh, and a buoyant um, painter uh, named Chicago, who's part of the group, realizes that we don't all have to die. Only one of us has to die, or appear to die. And then the prices of the paintings will skyrocket because the world values dead, dead artists more than living artists. I'm not exactly clear on how much this version, here's the version you published in 2003, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. which you, this is just what you had found in the archive, mm -hmm. but what's being performed on Broadway is slightly different, right? Yes, and Twain recognized that someone was going to have to do some work on the play, and in fact, in a letter to a friend, he said, whoever's going to produce this will have to struggle, but let him struggle, let him struggle. Um, Twain had a great imagination, tremendous sense of wit, a real feel for dialogue, but very little sense of the practicalities of putting on a play. So he had something like 35 characters in the original, and it would have required, you know, maybe at least 25 to 30 actors, which you can't do in a play these days. Um, David Ives, who is a marvelous contemporary playwright, the author of All in the Timing and the Philadelphia, and mainly famous for his one acts and his adaptations, the Encore series, um, adapted Twain's play for today's stage. And this meant um, boiling his some 35 characters down to um, about 17 or so that could be played with 11 actors with doubling, um, also turning three acts into two. Um, tightening things, um, fleshing out one of the parts a little more, making some scenes work that Twain knew he hadn't quite gotten to work, and adding a few things that, that make it a little, make it sparkle a little more the last act. It seems like it's a fine line with the changes because part of what you're selling is a Mark Twain play, mm -hmm. so you have to keep it a Mark Twain play, but you yes. want it to be an enjoyable evening at the theater. Exactly, and, and that was, um, in large part, that was um, the role that I played, that my job was to make sure that it stayed Twain's play. And I'm really glad to say that it did. Um, I think that the changes that Ives made don't distort Twain's, um, Twain's project. Uh, they don't make it a different play. He is really just making it a play that can be performed on today's stage. Twain was obviously such a talented writer with such an ear for, with such a voice that audiences loved then, love now. Mm -hmm. He cared so much about the theater and wanted to write a good play. Why wasn't he able to do it? Well, I think he finally did write a good play when he wrote as he did. F fair enough. I, let me ask you more broadly. Why wasn't he such a good playwright? Well, I think it's a common pattern that writers would often fall into when, when really aspiring to a genre that they had not spent a lot of time uh, working on doing apprentice work in. He was writing to popular formulas and trying to fit his imagination into um, into boxes where they, it didn't really fit. In other words, he was sort of a square peg in a round hole. He had imaginative ideas that worked beautifully in prose, but he didn't know quite how to work them on stage. But he did figure out how to write a good play here. Now, he did miss some of the challenges of how to make it work. In other words, it really doesn't need, you don't need three elderly French women in a scene where two will do just fine, and that's the kind of change that David Ives made. Um, but I think that, that being immersed in the wonderful theater world of Vienna, Twain finally, through osmosis or through hard work or combination of the two, figured out how to write a great play. I, I wanted to add, too, that this play has a very special place um, 
in my heart and also in Twain's career in that he had just come out of the darkest period of his life. His favorite daughter, his youngest daughter, had died a year and a half earlier, and he was just beginning to emerge from his grief. And in addition, he had just suffered a horrible bankruptcy, um, which was devastating to him, but he had just managed to pay off the creditors. And he celebrates his emergence from bankruptcy and his coming out of his grief by writing, writing this wild, over-the-top farce. Actually, David Ives has called it a Twainvestite farce, which I really like. Um, and I think that it's, a, it's a, um, an emblem of the resilience of uh, a figure like Twain at a moment when we really view him as being very uh, disillusioned and, and grim.